Welcome home, church. Welcome to Discovery Church once again. Man, we are in week three of the series, Is God With Us? I'm so glad you're here for week three of Is God With Us? We, we all ask this question at one time or another, God, are you really there? Uh, especially in the darker seasons of life, God, where, where are you? God, why am I going through this? And we, we really struggle with, with this thing of the presence of God. Uh, but, but may I just remind us before we dive into to uh, 1 Kings today. May I just remind us of Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23 is, has really been our anchor verse for this series. And Matthew chapter 1, verse 23 is a prophecy that was fulfilled. The prophecy was given some 700 years uh, back in Isaiah. Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, spoke these words uh, that, that came to fruition at the birth of our Savior Jesus. And so Matthew chapter 1, look, the virgin will conceive a child. And she will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel. We just sung about that, right? Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. What an encouragement. Before we go any further, what an encouragement that no matter where we go, no matter what we find ourselves in, God is present walking with his children. I don't know about you, but that does so much for, for me and for, for my soul. That no matter what mess I find myself in, God is present right there in the mess. Uh, that no matter what challenge or difficulty I'm faced with, that God is right there present with me. What an encouragement for us today that no matter what we're walking through, God is, is, is present with us. Man, I hope you're ready for God's word today. I hope you're excited about God's word today. Is anybody excited about God's word? Do you know that God's word is alive and, and active? That's why I get excited about God's word. It does something in, inside of me. I, I hope that you're ready, man, that you're excited. And I want to invite you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Over the past three weeks, and, and we'll wrap it up next week, we're looking at the life of Elijah, the life of, of Elijah, and the different seasons that we find ourselves in. As you're turning to 1 Kings chapter 19, we kicked off week one with chapter 17. And in verse one, the Lord tells Elijah, the Lord tells Elijah to, to go to King Ahab. King Ahab uh, was the 19th consecutive evil king. He was a wicked ruler over Israel. And so the Lord tells Elijah, who was an Old Testament prophet, an Old Testament prophet, by the way, is, is a man of God, was a man of God who spoke on behalf of God, a man of God who spoke on behalf of God. And, and so the Lord tells Elijah, to go to King Ahab and to tell him that there's not going to be any rain for a while. Uh, and so some of us are like, well, what does that matter, right? We can live without rain for a while. Uh, but that matters everything. That means everything to the country of, of, of uh, the nation of Israel. It means everything. Uh, it will shut down their economy uh, if there's a drought. And there would be a severe, severe drought. Uh, crops won't produce. Uh, the animals will starve and, and die. And, and the people will absolutely suffer. And so Elijah is obedient to the Lord. He goes and he speaks that to King Ahab and he lets him know that there's not going to be any rain until my command. And, uh, and then the Lord tells him, according to chapter 17, to go to the Kareth Brook located in the Jordan Valley. Go to the valley and I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to protect you. How many of you know, oftentimes we question God when we're in the valley. Like, God, why am I in this place? Uh, why am I in this isolated place? A valley is known as a place of isolation. A valley is known as a place of where battles take place and, and a place of desolation. And, and so Elijah goes to the Kareth Brook in the Jordan Valley and the Lord protects him. The Lord provides for him. There's a pain that he has to endure. And there's pain in our lives that we must endure that shapes us to be the man and woman that God has called us to be. And so in the middle of it, we're not all excited about the pain, but praise God after we go through the painful process because he does something inside of us. He shapes us, he molds us, he points us to our calling. And it's a painful process at times, but we trust God. I, I, I want to just share with you today, listen, if you're in the valley, I wanna encourage you that the valley is not your final destination. 
All throughout scripture, what we see when it comes to valleys is there's a passing through. There's a passing through. If you find yourself today in a dark valley, I want you to know that according to Psalm 23, that, that, that the Lord is present with you, first of all. But I want you to know, second of all, that, that you're just passing through that valley. God wants to do something inside of your life, inside of your, your, your heart. He wants to shape you. And that pain leads us to a total dependence. We see that. Uh, we saw that in week one with Elijah. And we've experienced, I don't know if you've experienced that. The pain that we endure leads us to a total dependence. We were created to totally depend on the Lord. To totally depend on the Lord. And so through the pain, that, that pain leads us to totally depend on the Lord. Have you trusted in the Lord? When was the last time you trusted in the Lord to come through? You know what I'm talking about? That job, those finances, that relationship. I'm trusting you, God. You're going to come through. And so I'm totally depending on you. And then God also does something in that, that part of total dependence upon him, it leads to an unconditional obedience. God, you've come through. You've proven yourself good and mighty and great and, 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 and completely trustworthy. And so I trust you. You've come through. And now I'm here available to do whatever you want to do through me. Unconditional obedience. So then the Lord speaks to Elijah. He speaks to Elijah and, and tells him to go to Zarephath. Zarephath. Everybody say Zarephath. Zarephath, it's an exciting word, Zarephath. And, and so it tells him to go to Zarephath and, and, and hang out in Zarephath. In Zarephath, the Lord uses Elijah to do incredible things, incredible things. Now, with that being said, keep in mind James chapter 5, verse 17. Would you write that down, James chapter 5, verse 17? Elijah was as human as we are. Man, I'm so thankful for the words of, of that scripture. Elijah was as human a, a, as we are. A lot of times when we look at the lives of these, these, these Old Testament men and women and we're like, man, I can't believe they've done these incredible things. And, and we forget that they were human just like we were. And God, God did some crazy big things through them. And it was all about the Lord. It was all about his power, his supernatural power through these men and women. And, and a lot of times, man, we're like, man, these guys are rock stars. I'll never add up. But, but I want you to know, Elijah was as human as, as we are. Now, the old saying, you know, they, they, they put their pants on the same way. It probably didn't apply to Elijah here because he was wearing like a tunic kind of deal. But, but, but you're with me in understanding what I'm talking about today. Elijah was as human as we are. Scripture continues in James 5. And yet when he prayed earnestly, when he prayed earnestly, the, 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 the earnest, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much and earnest, earnestly that no rain would fall. None fell for three and a half years. Verse 18. Then when he prayed again, the, God, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is referring, he's referring to what happened after Zarephath. The Lord tells Elijah in Zarephath, all right, you've hung out here long enough. Go back to King Ahab. Go back to the children of Israel. Call them to repentance. Call them to a contest. And we read about that. Last week we looked at, in chapter 18, the contest was on Mount Carmel. Turn to the person next to you and let them know there was a contest on Mount Carmel. There was a contest on Mount Carmel. Anybody like some caramel sauce? Okay. There's a contest on Mount Carmel. And, and what the Lord is doing through Elijah on Mount Carmel, again, he's calling the, the, the children of Israel to decide. Stop wavering. Make the decision today who you are going to serve. Last week, I, I kind of really pressed in on, on this, 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 this area it, that it's time to stop wavering and start worshiping. Man, it's time to stop stressing and start serving. And, and it's time to stop the pity party and start the praise party. It, it is time to decide, make the decision, make the decision who you are going to serve. Make that decision who you're going to serve. And so it's an incredible story that unfolds in Matthew, uh, Matthew in 1 Kings 18, right? It's an, it's an incredible story that, that, that unfolds. And so what Elijah does is he says, hey, we're going to build an altar. There's going to be this contest. You're going to go first. I'm going to go last. I, I, I don't know if he said some extra words. Uh, smarter like me probably would. Like, you know, like kind of, you know, like, hey, you're going to go first because my God's showing up. Uh, but, but, but we don't read about that. That's just my kind of interpretation. And so just uh, bear with me. But, but, but he allows them to go first, to build this altar, to cut up the bull. And he says, hey, do whatever you got to do. And if fire falls from heaven, then your God is the real God. And I'm going to do the same after you. 
And so what we read about in chapter 18, what we read about is that, that the, they, they cut up the bull. They build off, they cut up the bull. And they start raving, they start dancing, they start shouting. I mean, they're cutting, they're cutting themselves. Blood's gushing everywhere. It's a crazy, crazy story. But there's no response, absolutely no sound, no movement, no response. And so after about a all day of doing that, he says, it's my time. He rebuilds the altar. He cuts up his bull, places it on there, makes a trench, pours on water after water after water. And he prays to the Lord his God, answer me, Lord, today. Prove who you really are to your people today. And God throws down fire from, from heaven. Fire absolutely burned everything, even licked up the water, Scripture tells us. So then after that, after that mountain experience, he, he actually goes a little bit further up that mountain to the summit. A lot of times when we make it out of the valley, we, we're making our way to the mountain and we're like, I can't wait, baby. I can't wait till I get to that mountain. It's gonna be so good. And then there's a reality check. There's a, another challenge that we're faced. It's like, whoa, I didn't sign up for this, God. I signed up, you know, okay, I, I, I trusted you in the valley, but man, I was making my way up to the mountain to, to, to you know, and expecting a celebration party emojis, you know, and, and, and so, and, and so he goes through this contest, and then after that, he goes up to the, to the summit, and he sees the, servant sees the, the rain that's coming, and, and so that's, that's what James is referring to in James chapter 5, is that God is going to bring that rain, and so look at chapter 19 with me, first Kings chapter 19, verse 1, Ahab told Jezebel, everything that Elijah had done and how, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, may the gods punish me and do so severely if I don't make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Jezebel is the Ahab's wife uh, and she's not the nicest person. She's uh, just as wicked as King Ahab. She sends this message that, hey, you have killed all these prophets, 850 false prophets, 850 false prophets of Baal and Asherah after the fire fell from heaven, right? Get this picture. It, it means everything as we move forward in the text. After God showed up in a supernatural way and provided that fire from heaven, Elijah commands the children of Israel, the people of Israel to go after these false prophets, and execute them. At that point, all the, the men and, and maybe even some ladies, man, you would be like, yes, man, cheering them on. There's, there's an execution taking place. And, and so they're having the vengeance. And so Jezebel gets word of what just happened. She, she gets word of what just went down and, and she sends this message that I'm coming to kill you. That I'm coming to kill you. Look at verse three, chapter 19, verse three. Then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. He became afraid and immediately ran for his life. Once again, God had just shown up. Man, don't miss this. God had just shown up in a supernatural, powerful way, provided heaven, a uh, 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 fire from heaven to consume this altar. He showed up that day. And a woman, Jezebel, says, I'm coming to kill you. And he runs for his life. He runs for his life. They ran about 100 miles, which, I mean, like one mile is enough for me, right? You know what I'm saying? Anybody else with me? Some of you are, are, are runners, and that's cool. I'm, I salute you. Uh, but like one mile would be enough. About 100 miles, he runs from the north to the south. I've been to Mount Carmel. It's a beautiful place. And he runs from the north all the way to the south to a place called Beersheba. He's afraid. He runs for his life. And this is true of you and me as well. A lot of times when we look at scripture, we, we think, how could this person do this? I mean, God just showed up and did this supernatural thing. And, and then the next thing is a message from, 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 from the, the queen saying, I'm coming to kill you. And then you're running for your life. That's crazy. Well, how could Elijah forget what God just did? Uh, but before we uh, criticize Elijah, it's, it's very true of ourselves as well. When we're afraid, we run. I mean, just be honest, man. When we're afraid, we, we run. Listen, this is true in our marriages. This is true with our children. This is true in our jobs. This is even true in, in the church. 
In our marriages, just think for a moment, man, when there's an argument, what happens? What we see according to society is like, just take off and run. Just run. Man, I just, I don't, I don't want to deal with this. We're, we're missing a lack of humility, a, a lack of forgiveness. And so when I'm afraid, when I'm fearful, man, when there's this argument, this tension, our first response in the flesh is to, to run. It's to run. It's true in the area of our jobs. Man, there's all kinds of people and professional challenges that we face every day, right? Some of you, I just reminded you that Monday's tomorrow and, and the job's coming back. I'm sorry. It's the reality, though. It's coming. It happens every week. But there's all kinds of people in professional challenges. You're already thinking about, ah, oh, man, thanks for the reminder of, of this person I'm going to encounter tomorrow. This challenge that I left on Friday thinking it would just go away, but sorry, it's not going to go away. There's people and professional challenges. And oftentimes what we do when it comes to the area of job, we, we just say, man, I'll go to the next thing, right? Lord, send the next thing, send the next thing. And, and we're like legit on Indeed, on the computer, on our phones, rather, uh, uh, searching Indeed uh, job opportunities while we're still at the workplace. You, you, you've been there before. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, we run. We run. And with our children, we run. And, and I'm sorry to tell you, man, there, there's no perfect parent here. If you think you're the perfect parent, I got news, man. You're not. You're not. I mean, you might be a great parent. I've never met a perfect parent because I've never met a perfect person. Right? We, 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 we all miss it at times. We all miss it at times. So what oftentimes happens is, as man, we get, we get afraid. We get fearful. We, we, this tension builds up. And what do we do? We run. We run. We, 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 we give them our phone. We, we put them in, give them a tablet. We put them in front of the, the, the TV. And we run, man. And you're running for that bathroom, man, closing the door. And, and, and the fingers are still coming on under there. And you're like, go away. Yeah, go away. You ever been there? You've ever been there? We run, man, we run. We run from our children. Run from our children. Shared this that happened yesterday. Just yesterday. Man, I'm on the front of the property, and I look, I look out at, uh, on the other side of my, uh, the property, and, and my four-year-old had the leash and had uh, one of our dogs on the leash. And if you've ever met our dogs, they're both very strong. And I'm like, oh, this, this, what is going on? Why is she, you know, holding, like, why is she walking the dog? I, this doesn't make sense. And next thing I know, that dog just starts taking off through the water. You, your dog's ever done that? No, you have perfect dogs. No, you don't. And so, uh, <laughs> so that dog just goes through that water, man. It's, it's, I'm like, great, man. Now I got to bathe the stinking dog, add it to my to-do list. Like, I didn't, you know, yeah, your to-do list ever just grows. And, and uh, thanks, thanks, thank you, children. And so uh, I'm, I think I'm going to set this down here, man. It's killing me. And so... Uh, Next thing I see is, is our dog takes off for a busy road. And so I went from like thinking, ah, oh, crap, man, I got to bathe this dog to, oh, crap, man, this, my dog might die. Like legit, legit. It's a busy road. People are just going crazy speeds down the road. And my dog just takes off. Never done it before, just takes off. And so I, I run in the house, grab my keys and, 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 and like peel out and I'm headed towards the, the road and I find my dog in the middle of this busy road, middle of the busy road. Sorry, I don't have any cat stories. If you're a cat person, I'm not a cat person. I just have dog stories. And, and uh, so I hope, I hope you're still with me. I find my dog in the middle of this busy road. I, I, I put the dog back in the bed of the truck and I take off, I take off back to the house. And uh, man, just be honest, transparent, I, I was not happy with my four-year-old. I get the dog uh, set up. I look at my four-year-old. And I, 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 I ripped her. Man, I ripped her. And I had to come back and, and apologize. But, but, but where did that come from? It came from, man, I was afraid. I, was, I don't know if you've ever been there, man. Maybe it's just me. I was afraid that I, I was going to find a, a dog that we love and we've cared for in the middle of the road dead. And so oftentimes that's what we do with our children, man. We, we yell at them, we lash out at them. We're afraid, we're fearful. Church, it happens all the time in the church. You've experienced this. Man, I'm afraid of change. There's a building, building thing? Nah, I'll come back when it's a little bit easier, you know? Uh, you want me to give to this thing? Nah, nah, I just want to come and be comfortable. And so when we run, we run. We run from church to church to church. And we never develop to become the fully devoted follower of Christ that he's called us to be because we're always running. 
Stop running. And if that's you, stop running. Be committed. Next, what we see from the text is a very exciting thing. We see how to get depressed in three easy steps. So I hope you're with me. We see how to get depressed in, in three easy steps. I want to encourage you to write it down. I'm being serious. Uh, I'm being serious. Look at, look at verse 3. It <laughs> continues. When he came to Beersheba, he went from Mount Carmel all the way down to Beersheba. He ran 100 miles. You, you still with me? He ran 100 miles down to Beersheba, Beersheba that belonged to Judah. He left his servant there. The text tells us this. He left his servant there. Listen, man, you want to get depressed. You want to live in that place where you're fearful, man. You're afraid. You're lonely. It's a dark place. And then listen, shut people out. You want to get depressed, you shut people out. And may I just say this, specifically people that care for you. People that care for your soul. And oftentimes, isn't this true, you've ever experienced it? Man, you're just ticked off at the world and you just want to be left alone. People that care for you are, are, are calling, they're, they're crying out to you. We're like, no. What does he do? He leaves his servant there. And a servant, this servant would have done anything for Elijah. It would have done anything. He would have done anything, given everything for, for Elijah. And he leaves his servant in Beersheba. And so you want to get depressed. Listen, you want to stay in that place. He's running from his, for his life. Then shut people out. Next, next, we see in verse 4. Are you with me, verse 4? But he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He just ran this 100 miles. Then he continues going on a day's journey into the wilderness alone. So you want to get depressed. Don't not only shut people out. Listen, wear yourself out. Now, I'm, I'm guilty. I'll just be honest. I am absolutely guilty of it. Dad's in the house. He can attest. Uh, uh, Pastor Mike and others that are close to me, they, they, they can attest. I am absolutely guilty of this. But you want to live in this place of depression, of darkness, then, then continue to wear yourself out don't take time to rest always say yes wear yourself out he went on a day's journey into the wilderness man third third step third step third easy step to get depressed don't miss this focus on the negative focus on the negative look at verse four continues he sat down under a broom tree a broom tree about 10 feet and, and the branches provided some really great shade. That's all you need to know. Sat down on a broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I have had enough. Lord, take my life for I'm no better than my father's. You with me? Finds himself under this, this broom tree. And he said, I've had enough. I've had enough. I, I, and it's hard for me to connect it. I mean, the Lord just showed up on Mount Carmel, did supernatural things. I mean, he had the courage to stand up to the king, the most powerful person in the nation. He finds himself in a broom tree. What does he say? Lord, I've had enough. I've had enough. Where is that coming from? It comes from the same place the last time you said it. I've had enough. Oftentimes, we're so focused on just the negative things that we completely miss the, what God is doing. How God has blessed you. Remember that old hymn, count your blessings, name them one by one. I wonder when the last time you stopped and counted your blessings. You want to be in a place of darkness, a place of depression. Listen, you stay focused on the negative. You stay focused on the negative. The enemy wants you to stay so focused on the negative because if you, if you take your focus off of anything else, and you'll start to remember how good and great your God is. You'll, you'll start to remember that, that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You'll start to remember that victory is yours in Christ Jesus. You'll start to tap into the resurrection power that's available in Christ Jesus. You'll, you'll start to remember that, that God's grace is sufficient for you. You'll start to remember that his mercies are new each, each day. Are, are you with me today? Are you, are you understanding where I'm going? Man, you stay focused on the negative. You want to continue to live in the dark place. Stay focused right there. I've really been, been wrestling with this, uh, with this thought for, for, for some time now. That, that whatever gets my attention gets me. I've really come to find how true that is. Whatever gets my attention gets, it gets me, it, con, it consumes me. Whatever gets your attention gets you. Last time I, I lost my phone, 
The only thing I could think about is finding my phone. You ever been there? I, no, you never lose anything. And so I, I lost it. I'm like, where's my phone, man? I'm yelling. I'm like, nah, blah, blah. And, you know, asking everybody around me, have you seen my phone? Did you take my, are you playing games? You better not be playing games. You know, and it's, got, it's got me again. It gets my attention. I'm so focused on it. I can't think of the next thing I got to do because I'm so focused on it. You ever been fired from a job? And you're so ticked off. There's all kinds of thoughts that are running through your mind that no one else should hear. But it gets your attention. Whatever gets you, whatever gets your attention gets you. You're so focused on the negative that we miss what God is doing in the midst of losing that job. That man, he closes one door to only open another door. We stop trusting him and we take on all the trust ourselves. You ever get that call from the doctor saying, hey, this doesn't look good. And so you spend all night and day researching as if you're a doctor. Don't do that, by the way. Please stop doing that. You're, you're, you're like, you, you've blown this thing so far out of proportion. And here's what happens. And I'm not trying to make light of, of, of cancer and, and illness, not one iota. But listen, here's what happens. We, we forget that we serve the great physician. We, we forget that God is still absolutely in control. He was sovereign before the phone call, before the report, as he's going to be sovereign during the phone call, as he's sovereign after the phone call. He's still the same God. But whatever gets our attention gets us. And we're so focused on the negative. I heard this this week. I love it, man. I want to encourage you with it. When you're ready to quit, listen, when you're ready to quit, remember this, remember this. It takes pain to have progress and it takes a hurt to have a healing. It takes a struggle to have a story and it takes a trial to have a testimony. Listen, listen closely, listen closely. Come on in. When, when you're ready to quit, remember, remember this. It takes pain to have progress. It takes a hurt to have a healing. It takes a struggle to have a story. It takes a trial to have a testimony. So you want to stay in that place of depression, of darkness. Listen, continue to shut people out. Continue to wear yourself out and continue to focus on the negative. Now, now there's good news here at the end. It's like a Disney film. There's good news. There's always good news at the film. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. And you want to overcome depression, two, two things, two thoughts. Just I'd encourage you to write them down. Four words. Here we go. Physical rest, spiritual replenishment. Physical rest, spiritual replenishment. What, what do we mean? Let's go to the text first. Verses five, verse five through eight. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him. The angel told him, get up and eat. Six, verse six. Then he looked. And there at his head was a loaf of bread baked over hot stones and a jug of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord returned for a second time and touched him. He said, get up and eat or the journey will be too much for you. So he got up, ate and drank. Then on the strength from that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Listen, we have to eat. Praise God for that. Can we just say, can we just agree to that? Come on, man. You like food? I, man, some of you are like, What's for lunch? Come on, man, get done with this thing. Man, I, lo I love food. Can you, can you tell I love food? I'm thankful for this text that just affirms my love for food. But, but in all reality, man, we have to eat in, in order for, for several things to happen. One, one to, to relax, right? There's something about comfort food. Man, I love that comfort food. I love just being a Southern man, comfort food. Uh, we have to eat to relax. And something special, by the way, happens as we break bread together, right? I, we need to bring back the Sunday tradition of eating together as a family. If you don't, bring it back. Let's, let's start something. Let's start something, man. A Sunday dinner together. Everybody's together. But, 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 but man, we eat to relax. We, we eat to think straight. Have you ever, like, you, your mind is so many places, and it's as simple as stopping to eat to bring you back to focus? Anyone ever been there? It's just me? Okay. Uh, so... <laughs> Next time, think, think, this, think, you think straight, you eat to think straight. Hey, next is for good health. Now, uh, now that's your decision, you know what I'm saying, what you eat as far as the good health goes. But, but it, 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 it promotes good, good health. Food promotes good, good health. You have to have it to be able to, to have good, good, good health. And, and the last is to have strength. And it, it gives you strength. 
And thank God for this text. Next, what we see is, as far as the physical rest, it's a combination of eating and sleeping. And I'm so thankful because I love these two things, eating and sleeping, right? Can anybody else with me? Come on. Sunday nap's coming, man. It's only a few hours away to the glory of God. And, and so uh, you with me? And so we, we need, man, if we're going to overcome any kind of depression or darkness, listen, man, we need to examine what we're eating and how we're eating. And we need to examine uh, how we're resting. Man, some of you only get a couple hours of sleep. You need to really think that through. Talk it through. Don't research it on Google, though. Don't, don't do that. But, but, but get some help. We need to be able to rest. Often the most, listen, often the most holy, God-honoring thing that you and I can do, in all seriousness, is go to sleep. It's go to sleep. I I really, truly believe one of the most God-honoring things that that I can do at times is to go to sleep. I got a call years ago. It's about 10 o'clock at night from from a man in our church. And he said, Tim, and we need you. I said, 10 o'clock? <laughs> All right, what do we need? And he goes, my wife and I, we've been arguing for hours. Arguing for hours. She's mad at me. I'm mad at her. We can't figure this thing out. We need you. I said, okay. Two things. First, when we hang up, both of you go to sleep. Stop arguing. Go to sleep. And for for tonight, I don't even care what it looks like. Just go to sleep. Second, tomorrow, call me and let's meet. Look at scripture and talk this thing through. And so he said, that's not what I, that's not, I, I, I wanted you now. I said, no, you don't got me now. You need to go to sleep. Your wife needs to go to sleep. And we need to talk tomorrow. So he said, okay. They went, to, they went to sleep, hung up, they went to sleep, called me the next day. We met, and for the, for the glory of God, we were able to talk through the, the arguments, and there was reconciliation and forgiveness and humility. Man, man we, we missed the importance of, of physical rest. Psalm 23, we begin to close, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I have what I need. Can we just say Amen. Thank you, God, that you are the great shepherd. A lot of times we try to shepherd, be, be, the, be the chief shepherd. No, no, let him be the chief shepherd of our lives. He's got it. He's got it. Verse 2, he lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Do you, see, do you see these words with me? He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Doesn't that just sound so soothing? Man, I... If you're like me, I, I, in all honesty, I struggle with rest. As I said, I, I'm guilty about wearing myself out. And if I can just be very transparent with you, and I have something that I struggle with daily. And the struggle for me, one of my struggles, and it's between the, the, me and the Lord, and, and he's doing a work inside of my heart. But I have a struggle that I am going to let someone down. I have a very real struggle. And so I always got to answer my phone. I always got to say yes. I always got to do all these things. Uh, I'm going to let someone down. And you know, lately what the Lord's just been speaking to my heart is, yeah, you're going to let somebody down. Man, if you don't take time and rest, you're going to absolutely let somebody down for the rest of your life. When I got that word from the Lord, I mean, it just really began changing changing my heart, my attitude. Changed everything. Some of you just need to hear, it's okay to rest. And it's taken me many years to come to that point where it's okay to rest. And if people leave the church, so be it. My first priority has got to be my family. And I'm okay with telling the church that my first priority is not you. My first priority is my family. And if you're not okay with that, then quite frankly, in in love and humility, I don't know that you're okay with me. But my first priority is my family. If I can't lead and disciple them, 
How can I lead and disciple the church? So physical rest. And we close with this spiritual replenishment. What does that really mean? Allowing the Lord to minister to our hearts and to our souls. Allowing the Lord to grow us in the faith. Allowing the Lord to breathe life, spiritual life into our beings. Don't miss this. Verse 3 of Psalm 23. He renews my life. Do you see the text? He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. You see this, what he does? After that rest comes replenishment. The Lord begins caring for our soul, ministering to us in a way that only he can minister to. Do you see in the text in 1 Kings 19, I don't miss this. Twice the angel of the Lord reaches out and touches Elijah. Do you see that in the text? Man, I love that. Then in that wilderness, in that place of wandering, the Lord was still with him, reached out touched him, provided for him, breathed life in him. And we need a break for the Lord to be able to minister to our soul. We need to stop say, Lord, fill me up. One of the greatest ways we can do that is, listen, don't miss this. One of the greatest ways we can do that is by feeding on the word of God. Can I just repeat that? One of the greatest ways that that we can experience the spiritual replenishment is feeding on the word of God. First Peter 2, 2 says, like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out, cry out for this nourishment. Cry out for this nourishment. We look to the word of God, which is truth and authority. His word sets us free. Not the word of man, but the word of God sets us free. We find life in the word of God. We find wisdom, all wisdom and guidance in the word of God. Church, feed on the word of God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? All across this place, just for a moment, would you just say, Lord, what is my response today? Lord, what is my response today all across this place? Would you just say that simple word to, to the Lord? What is my response today? Maybe you've been shutting the right people out. Maybe you've been wearing yourself out. Perhaps your, your focus has been on the negative. And it's time today to say, Lord, help me to rest and replenish. Help me to find rest in you and, and, and care for my soul, Lord, in a way that only you can. Help me, Lord, to just be still and know that you are God. Help me to take time today to rest in you. So, Lord, I pray. I pray that, Lord, we would not just today be hearers of your word. Oh, God, help us to be doers of your word. Help us, Lord, to, to hear your voice. And to not just hear it, but to allow you to change us, God. Help us to trust you completely. Help us to be reminded today that you will never leave us nor forsake us. You will never abandon us. Thank you, Lord, for Emmanuel, God with us. And so we praise you. We thank you. We give you all the glory and all the honor. In the name of Jesus, I pray.